All right, hello everybody. Welcome to Historian Stitch. Um, obviously, it's another Civil War day, um, but there is a purpose to what I'm wearing. It's not just for the hell of it today. Um, forgive me, I keep messing with the collar because it's not actually attached. It's a removable collar. Um, basically, what we're doing today is a how-to Wednesday per usual. It's actually on time this time. Um, except for not really doing much of a how-to. This is more of an information video. Um, I apologize if I completely butcher this, but we had a comment on our how to dress in 1850s through 1860s uh, work dresses. Um, the commenter's channel is uh, Jemima Page. Thank you for actually commenting, by the way. Um, I love getting questions, and that's answering questions like that is what I would normally be doing for work. Um, obviously, with COVID and everything, things got a little discombobulated, but with those questions, I get to go into interpreter mode, uh, hence the clothing today. Um, but one of the questions that she asked was about uh, middle class women during the American Civil War and how the war affected them, um, as well as the hobbies of mainly what she was looking for is uh, a cotton mill owner's daughter. What would they be doing? Um, as a cotton mill owner's daughter, you are probably going to be upper middle class, if not upper class. Um, so I'll, there's definitely a lot more time for hobbies. Um, and then at the end of this video, I have a whole stack of books here um, that we'll go through. And basically, these are just some of the sources that I tend to use. Um, she's looking more from a northern perspective to the southern and how I said that wrong. She's looking more at a northern perspective during the war whereas I tend to stick with the southern perspective so that's basically what most of these books are. Um but for the most part a lot of what you can find transfers over in either direction. Um, obviously, once you get into the lower classes, lower, middle, low classes of society, a lot of things change from north to south during the American Civil War, especially in terms of dirt farmers versus mill workers. Um, if I were living in the north and not yet married, um, I would be likely a mill girl or a seamstress. I tend to represent a seamstress when we're out doing living history things anyway, um, just because that's what I do in real life and that's the easiest thing to transfer, transfer over from modern life to period life, so to speak. Um, so yeah, uh, to answer the first question that I got with that, um, The war mainly affected, from what I can gather, the middle class and the lower class. Um, there was no real issues within the upper classes of society during the American Civil War because they had enough money that they could pay for their draft to be sent off to somebody else. Um, there were drafts in both the North and the South. Um, a lot of times that is how upperclassmen would get out of ending up in the war is you would get your draft card or how a draft letter probably is the better way of explaining that. Um, and they would look at it and they would go to the closest magistrate or court and go, I'm not going. I am going to pay this $600 bill and send that person off instead. Um, which kind of muddies a lot of things if you look at the old ways old ways of how the American Civil War has been taught. Most people don't know that there were drafts. 
much less that you could actually pay to get out of them. Obviously, that didn't happen during World War II and Vietnam era. Um, but in the Civil War times, you could actually pay to get out of it. When it comes to the women and how it affected them, it did a lot of damage. Um, suddenly, there are a whole lot less men around you, so you don't have your typical... I'm just going to sit back and be this pretty thing that takes care of the house and the kids and does these very specific tasks to my husband's not here, my brothers aren't here, there's no one around to take care of me, I have to do this on my own now. Which for middle and lower class families wasn't that hard because the gender roles of those families spread farther and were far more diverse than it was for the upper classes. The problem with that is, or the problems for them came through shortages. Um, my capstone project was mainly focused around that and how it affected the terms of mourning um, and grieving at the time, but it transfers over to all aspects of life. Whether it be I'm missing coffee, so I'm going to use chicory instead. Um, or I can't get this kind of fabric anymore, so we need to start reusing some really old things that we didn't really want to cut up, but we have to now. Um, granted, a lot of that is more of a southern thing that ends up happening. Um, there is some speculation that a lot of those stories came from after the war to make the war seem harsher on Southerners than it was. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that there was obviously a class divide and a problem when it came to being a lower middle class family. If you were having to use chicory for your coffee before the war, you're not getting paid enough somewhere in the process, which is obviously obviously still a problem in some families today. Um, there are a lot of crossovers back and forth, so if you think about it in today's terms, you can basically parallel it to then. Um, kind of scary sometimes. Now, the other question with that was, um, what hobbies did middle class or upper middle class uh, women have for the most part? What would a cotton mill owner's daughter do? Across the board, no matter who you are or what social status you have, a lot of your hobbies would be sewing, reading, writing, those two being if you were educated well enough. Um, you might enjoy horseback riding and do that if your family is wealthy enough to have a horse. Sorry. You might do embroidery, which I tend to just kind of throw under the sewing aspect, but for them, sewing was making clothes for the most part. Um, you might be a quilter. Uh, you could do tatting, like anything that's super decorative and looks rather useless and was rather useless tended to be a hobby. Um, one thing that like, if you look at the things that you do as any part, like any member of society, and you look at it as a hobby, that's probably what somebody did as a hobby 150, 200 years ago. Um, there is no, we're not really creative people. Uh, the only thing we've gotten created, creative with is how we do it. Uh, what they were doing by hand then, we are doing with machines now. That's basically the only difference. Um, now, if you want to learn more about all of this stuff, the easiest places to find it is um, there are lots of online resources. I know it's really hard to go through and sieve through everything. Um, the easiest places I have learned to look are JSTOR, uh, J-S-T-O-R, uh, dot com or dot org. 
I can't remember which at the moment. It is basically nothing but journal articles, whether the journals be this thick or the typical small ones. Um, and you can look up any number of things. Most of the articles are free. You can download them for free. You just can't print them off without paying. Um, that's a really good site for getting a general knowledge of what you're looking at. Um, another good place to go is, of course, just Google. Um, once you do Google, though, you want to do an advanced search. Uh, you look up your tip. Basically, how you would do that is you look up your generic question. Uh, and then once it pulls up all of your stuff, you click settings and go to advanced search. And what I do from there is I go to the site or domain uh, options, and you can do .gov, .edu. Uh, org anything that most scholarly articles would be under so that way you're getting um, National Park Service stuff you are getting University of North Carolina articles you're getting people's capstones you're getting all sorts of information that has been thoroughly researched from there you can kind of look at everybody else's um, footnotes and stuff and use their resources for your own. I do that a lot. Um, but in terms of a lot of the books that I have at the moment to show you guys are ones that I've used in class. Um, Dr. Broomall at Shepherd University loves lots and lots of books, which isn't a bad thing at all because he's the reason I have so many now. Um, but he is also the reason that there are so many sticky notes in them as well. Oh, um, so just as a general history of the Civil War and Reconstruction, if you don't really know that much about the American Civil War, Fateful Lightning uh, by Alan C. Guelzo, G U E L Z O. Um, it's a new history of the Civil War and Reconstruction. It's really well written. Um, had to do a book report on it. It was very well written. It's a little bit thick and dense at times. Um, but that's what you get when you have a well, how many pages is it? 530 ish page book that's a lot of information um and of course all of his footnotes are at the bottom of the pages so they're super easy to find um if you are looking for the lives of 19th century people um i haven't gotten to read it yet but from what i have read thus far um how to be a victorian a dawn to dusk guide of victorian life by Ruth Goodman is really good. Um, it goes through what the waking up process, what you would be wearing as soon as you get up in the morning, what you're eating, uh, personal grooming, midday meal, um, all sorts of things. And of course, the Victorian era is anywhere from 1830s through 1880s, 1890s. I can't remember when her reign technically ended, um, which is really bad for a 19th century historian, but whatever. Um, it talks about the outfits. Um, this would also go through some of the typical day-to-day -day things that you're going to be doing, obviously, as well as the very generic this is what they're doing for hobbies, this is what they're sewing, this is how they're cleaning stuff. Um, if you need a generic how to live life as a Victorian, this is a really good one. Um, of course, if you want to go deeper into what they themselves, like what a specific person or class of people were doing, uh, using letters and diaries are always a good place to start. Um, One's kind of like this one, Far From Home. Uh, this is a third South Carolina 
specific book um, between a family of South Carolinians um, and just the letters that they were sending back and forth. The only problem with using letters and diaries is you have to be able to critically analyze them, uh, not just for who wrote them and how they were writing then and how letter etiquette and diary etiquette worked then, but also when was it published, who published it, what was possibly edited into it or out of it within the past hundred or so years, um, which side of the war were they on, um, and you kind of want to start cross-referencing what you see in those letters and diaries with the knowledge that you will have gained before, hopefully before reading those, unless you're someone like me and just enjoy reading someone's personal entries and seeing how they were living and dealing with things. Um, from there, if you want to continue digging further, there are so many books on women's lives during the American Civil War. Um, ones like Women of Blue and Gray, this one's fairly good. Um, this one in particular talks about uh, the mothers and just women in general, but it specifies uh, mothers, medics, soldiers, spies, all of the people that you don't really hear about all that often. Um, and then the rest of, at least the rest of these three, um, are all very Southern, um, sided and just a critical view of who they, who the women were in the middle and upper classes, how they were dealing with life during the war, um, women's lives during the American Civil War was, were insane. Um, you have spies like Rose Greenhow in Richmond. You have entire networks of women who were using the newspaper systems to get word out going, hey, if you use these materials, you can dye this dress or this color dress in particular, this color or this fabric, this color. Um, if you have these things in your pantry, you can cook this and survive for another week. Um, you basically see women go from in north, in the north and in the south. These quiet, petite, timid things um, that were just kind of there to help men progress throughout their lives and do quietly what they were expected socially to all of the men are gone. We need to be actually productive in our lives and they're the ones cooking and cleaning and doing the farm work and creating entire networks from nothing. Um, it's basically a zero to 100 kind of interval there of not really doing anything with the exception of a few women to nope, we are going to be in your face and we don't care anymore. Um, which is interesting when you look at it after the war, um, but I am getting close to 20 minutes now. I apologize. Um, might do another segment about something akin to this unless somebody else has questions. Um, if you do have any questions, please put them in the comments below, whether it's on Facebook or YouTube. Um, if you're on YouTube, uh, like, follow, subscribe, however all of that works. Um, and yeah, I will see you all next time. Please ask questions. Um, all of the books that I mentioned here are on Amazon. Amazon is your friend. If you are trying to do research, because you can just look up a generic search, on there and a whole list of books will be coming up. Um, when it comes to historical things like this, I try to look up the books, 
on Amazon and then I will take the author's name and look it up in a separate tab and just see, okay, who is this person and why would they be writing about it? Because that in and of itself is also a really important thing to distinguish when you are doing research. Um, but that being said, we might do a how-to video next week on how to do proper research. That would be fun. Um, so yeah, I will see you all next time. Everybody have a good morning or afternoon, whatever time it is. And I will see you all possibly on Friday. We will see what we can do for like a battlefield walk or something. So, bye.